Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to today's book discussion of Free Speech and Liberal Education, A Plea for Intellectual Diversity and Tolerance by Donald A. Downs, recently published by the Cato Institute. I'm Kat Murthy, and I'm Cato's direct, uh, Associate Director of Audience Engagement and Acquisition. You can find me on Twitter as at Kat Murthy. The status of free speech and academic freedom at U.S. colleges and universities has become an explosive issue. Reports of disruptions, disinvitations of speakers, and a host of bureaucratic new speech inhibiting policies emanate from college campuses that were once considered bastions of free speech advocacy. Critics claim these actions and measures have smothered the open and honest discourse that's so necessary for classrooms, both inside and outside of those classrooms. Others consider the fears of the crisis overblown, calling the harms much less extensive in the vast domain of higher education than critics acknowledge. We have an excellent panel lined up for you today, and I hope to make this an interesting discussion for all of you. You can submit your questions on Twitter using hashtag Cato Books in the Facebook or YouTube comments on this video or in the question box on the Cato page. First, I'd like to introduce you to Donald Downs. Don is the author of this book, and the Alexander Michael John Professor of Political Science Emeritus and Affiliate Professor of Law and Journalism Emeritus at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's won numerous local and national awards for scholarship in support of free speech and academic freedom. Don, what inspired you to write this book? First of all, they're both proximate causes and longer range uh, causes. Uh, the proximate were some of the things you just alluded to, Kat. Uh, speech disruptions, for example, mm -hmm. at Middlebury in 2017, uh, which I call in the book a... Uh, and then there were broader uh, aspects, uh, new bureaucratic policies that we'll be talking about today. I won't get into them right now because I'll be talking about them later but um, they had a big impact on my, my thinking. And these started happening, started you know, coming about uh, sometime around two, 2012 and a little bit later than that. So they were starting to have an effect. And then you know, even more broadly was just my concern about what this was doing to higher education. I'll be talking a lot about that uh, later, but uh, I saw this as really a betrayal of what a university was supposed to be and of why I got into the university uh, in the first place. Uh, I came to Wisconsin from Notre Dame back in 1985 because of Wisconsin's reputation for being a place where there was a really vital and vibrant clash of ideas. And uh, after a few years there, I started seeing the impact of these new policies uh, on campus and I felt betrayed. So uh, that inspired me to do it as well. So a combination of more proximate and broader uh, concerns. Thank you, Don. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about that. Next, I'd like to introduce all of you to Nadine Strassen. Nadine is the John Marshall Harlan II Professor of Law at New York Law School, past president of the American Civil Liberties Union, and author of Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. Nadine, you actually blurbed Don's book, writing that in free speech and liberal education, Donald Downs has provided me with invaluable thought-provoking thought new insights, and that he balances due concern with appropriate hope. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, please? Nadine, I'm sorry, you're actually muted. You're still, you're still muted. Okay, um, Nadine, I am going to skip ahead and introduce uh, our next guest and we'll come back to you in one second. Um, I would also like to introduce Katie Harbath. Katie is the global lead for politics and government engagement at Facebook, where she focuses on political outreach 
And she's also an alumni of the University of Wisconsin, where she served on the editorial board of the campus newspaper, The Badger Herald. You can find Katie on face, uh, I'm sorry, on Twitter as at Katie Harbath. Katie, you had a very personal experience with campus free speech suppression when you were writing for the Badger Herald. Can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, um, thank you for having me, Kat. Um, actually, one of the first ways that Professor Downs and I met was um, back in early 2000s, um, the Badger Herald was a part of um, a discussion around, we had allowed um, an ad to run by David Horowitz around why reparations for slavery were wrong and racist too. And it sparked a big discussion across the country because there were other universities who chose not to run that ad. Um, and we at the Herald did choose to do so on free speech grounds. And it was one of the first, um, first experiences I had of dealing with free expression on campus and um, dealing with protests and others around um, what should or should not be allowed in terms of speech on on campus. And it was really a starting point for me of uh, really learning and being more a part of um, and thinking about what, how do you think about speech and what is or is not allowed. And frankly, it's things that we continue to even discuss today when you think about speech online and in the elections. Great, thank you. Uh, definitely looking forward mm -hmm. to continuing that discussion. Um, next, I would like to introduce all of you to Robbie Suave. Robbie's a senior editor at mm -hmm. Reason Magazine and author of Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump a book about trampling of free speech and due process in the name of social justice. You can find him on Twitter as at Robbie Suave. Robbie, you argue that since President Trump was elected, the silencing, on view, uh, silencing of views on college campuses has worsened. Can you elaborate a bit on that, please? Um, intensified. Uh, <laughs> The feelings of many uh, of many uh, politically active people on college campuses made their activism feel more uh, more relevant and more necessary. And unfortunately, for some of them, that uh, that free speech is not a a tool of activism or a way to share your perspective or get your point across but in fact an obstacle to the kind of world that many progressives would like to build beginning on college campuses. So you saw an increasing hostility to, to the very idea that someone who holds a different perspective or a perspective that, that dissents from uh, what, the, what the, the new kind of progressive left believes, uh, they should not be welcome on campus and indeed, them expressing that view is not just objectionable, but a matter of, of safety, of public safety. So we've seen an increasing number of calls on campuses to, to, to thwart or to stop uh, speech, to stop expression, uh, because it's a matter of safety. And by safety, they mean uh, emotional health and well-being, which is a component of mm -hmm. physical safety. I'm also troubled to see this kind of trend uh, uh, leaking out of the, I think it emanates to some degree from the college campuses, uh, but is is infecting the broader culture. Um, is is uh, it's happening on social media? It's happening in elite media institutions where you have employees saying that it would be wrong. Uh, it would be a matter of safety. Uh, it would undermine safety to to pub perhaps publish an opinion at a place like the New York Times or the Atlantic uh, that mm -hmm. that that the staff disagrees with. So that's uh, and that. We, we saw that starting in the campus, Middlebury, Evergreen, other places, and now it's, 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 it's much broader in scope. Thank you, Robbie. Um, I'm, I'm seeing here uh, that it looks like Nadine's mic is working now. So Nadine, I'd love to come back to you um, to talk a little bit about uh, your reaction to Don's book, as well as your own book, and um, some of the insights that you drew out of that. First of all, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? 
Oh, fabulous. It's Thank not you. an online I, event if we don't have the delay. Restored. <laughs> Thanks to David. And I, I really want to get back to your terrific first question, Kat, which was uh, what, and going back to my blurb, that Don's book gives me both cause for concern and cause for hope. The cause for concern has already been laid out by all of the other speakers. I think I would just like to uh, underscore that surveys consistently show that too many college students uh, enthusiastically support even official repression. or offensive comments, uh, but also perhaps even more insidiously, there is an enormous chilling effect. Very high percentages of people say that they uh, do not express their views on important public policy issues because of fear that they're going to be called out or worse yet, subject to some kind of actual cancellation type pressure, losing a job or another opportunity. So uh, segue from the cause for concern to the cause for hope. And actually, I'm going to do that by underscoring one fact that Don stresses in his book, and I'm going to read it now, uh, is from page 145. He says, as often seen in this book, the actions of a few students can set the public tone of an institution if counter voices and counter actions remain dormant. So the bad news is that uh, the vast majority of people on campus who do support free speech, uh, as underscored in Don's book, and I should say also in Rob left and right who are exerting uh, pressure to censor are in a minority, but the majority are a silent majority. So the hope lies in encouraging all of us, and I'll put myself in that category, to raise our voices even more strongly. And here I want to say Don himself is the best example because Don started as a supporter of so-called hate speech codes on college campuses for faculty and students dramatically and became a leader of the movement to oppose those hate speech codes, became a leader of defending free speech, not only on his own campus, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, but of nationwide significance. So uh, he embodies uh, the kind of steps that will give all of us hope if more of us follow in, in Don Down's footsteps. Thank you for that very hopeful note, Nadine. I think that's also an important part of this discussion. It's not all doom and gloom. Um, and on that, I want to introduce all of you to our final panelist today, Jason Kuznicki. Jason is editor of Cato Books and of Cato Unbound, the Cato Institute's online journal of debate. You can find him on Twitter as at Jason Kuznicki. Jason, what makes campus free speech such an important issue and why did Cato decide to publish this book? Well, it's important for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the United States has uh, had a very heavily college educated population. This is an experience we all have to some degree. Uh, the issue of free speech is one that's always been important to Cato, uh, but uh, it's important, it's salient in a way that it uh, has not been uh, for many years. And just recently it has become, become increasingly salient because of uh, the uh, rise of uh, demands that uh, certain types of speech not be approved or not be accepted and what that all means. And uh, that's, I, I put that in a very vague way because that is a, uh, it's a big phenomenon. It has a lot of different aspects and uh, uh, which speech we allow when or which speech we think is appropriate or inappropriate is something that's going to vary uh, depending on forums. Uh, depending on uh, the institutions or the rules of the institutions that uh, that host speech. And uh, because we all have the common experience of the university setting, or because so many of us have the common experience of the university setting, those rules are often used as as benchmarks or as uh, as uh, at least normative standards for our conduct in the rest of society. 
So uh, if we want to preserve free speech in the larger society, which uh, is one that's heavily college educated, we ought to give a, a good deal of thought to the question of free speech on campuses, even when uh, we're not hearing all kinds of alarming stories out of the campuses themselves. And it happens that in recent years, we are hearing those sorts of stories. So it's a timely book. It's, uh, it's an important book. Uh, it is not a doom and gloom book, which uh, uh, I think is I think is fair and correct. Uh, there are there are uh, both some uh, you know, alarming anecdotes, but also some reason for hope. So uh, so that's uh, why we publish it. I would say. Thank you, Jason. And I think you you bring up a really important point here, right? Words have meaning, but not everyone tends, uh, not everyone has the same understanding of what that meaning might be. And I think that that especially comes to a head when we have these sort of cultural clashes over issues like free speech. So to begin this discussion, I, I'd like to hear from each of you um, what exactly free speech is, what, what that term means and why it's important. Um, Don, can we start with you as the author of the book? Sure. Um, there's really, there's kind of a legalistic interpretation as well as a more normative one. In the book, I, I do both. Uh, the Supreme Court has defined free speech for First Amendment purposes as the intent to convey a message that would be understood as such. Now, that comes out of the Texas versus Johnson flag burning case back in 1989. And uh, so I think of the, the movie My Cousin Vinny. And remember the, at the end of the movie, Lisa and uh, Vinny are talking about whether they're gonna have a spontaneous marriage or a romantic, or excuse me, a wedding, or a romantic kind of wedding, a bigger wedding. And uh, he says, I want to spend spontaneous. And Lisa says, a burp is spontaneous. It's not romantic. <laughs> and same by the same token, if you just burp, uh, as an example, that in itself is really not First Amendment speech. But if you burp in order to make some sort of statement like you disagree with what someone just said and you disagree rather inarticulately then that would qualify uh, for first amendment speech because you're conveying a message with that burp and uh so the symbols are free speech not just simply language uh so that's a supreme court kind of a approach to it context also matters uh the amount of speech you would have or the kind of a speech you would have in a classroom as we'll talk about later differs from speech outside in a public forum because the classroom has a definitive purpose. Uh, so time, place, and manner and context uh, can make a difference. I also make a distinction in the book, and it's one I really like, but I didn't really develop enough, partly for reasons of space, and maybe it's worth another shorter book or if Cato lets me write an epilogue. Uh, I distinguish speech from expression. And usually under First Amendment law, expression is the term that's used. I like speech better. It has a more qualitative, uh, kind of more scholarly uh, connotation to it. And so I use the term uh, speech more than expression, though I'm quite comfortable also with, uh, with expression. Uh, to me, speech represents both uh, the right and as I portray in the book, and this sort of speaks to uh, Nadine's point about the imperative of a constructive you know, resistance and reform, a responsibility to speak your mind uh, with honesty and with clarity. I, I quote uh, Charles Krauthammer in the book, who said that uh, you betray your whole life if you don't say it honestly, if you don't say what you mean honestly and bluntly. And so uh, this is very important. Uh, in the book, I talk about the importance of intellectual honesty as part of speech. And I say that if you don't really speak your mind clearly and bluntly, and especially in an academic context, right, where we're supposed to do that, uh, that in a sense, if not legally, at least morally, it's a kind of intellectual fraud because you're presenting something that you really don't believe. And so the honesty issue is very important. And uh, I quote uh, from the famous uh, flag salute case in schools, uh, the Barnett case, 1943, I read you what uh, Justice Jackson, one of my favorite uh, Supreme Court justices, says about the importance of free speech. So this sort of speaks not to just what is speech, but why it matters. 
which we'll also talk more about later. Those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves exterminating dissenters. Compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. I love that quote. If there is any fixed star in a constitutional constellation, it is that no official, higher petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or matters of opinion, or force students, citizens, to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit of an exception, they do not know, they do not now uh, occur to us. And finally, in chapter seven, which is really the, the kind of penultimate chapter of the book, though it's only one of eight, uh, I talk about three primary justifications for free speech, especially in an academic context. Uh, one is what I call deontological, that it's a, it's a good thing in itself, regardless of any kind of utilitarian consequences. Uh, the second is uh, utilitarian and consequentialist. It's an indispensable means to truth and other kinds of social goods. And finally, ethical conscience. And the book really says a lot about that. How the rigors, being able to live up to the rigors of constitutional discourse in a democratic republic requires certain character attributes and can contribute to them, which makes citizenship uh, more solid. And that's another big emphasis in the book. So I talk about both what it means technically and also why it matters. That was a really good comprehensive response and gives us a good idea of what uh, the theories in the book are working from. Um, Nadine, you were past pre you are past president of the ACLU, and I know that the ACLU has kind of gotten uh, pushback from both sides of the ideological spectrum for uh, your approach to free speech. Can you talk a little bit about what free speech means when you're talking about it? Yes. Well, uh, Kat, in terms of pushback, I want to show an earlier book of Don's, Nazis in oh. Skokie, when oh. Don wrote this in yeah. 1985. He opposed the ACLU's defense of free speech, uh, even for hateful speech, even for speech that is inconsistent with our own civil liberties principles. But that was, and then Don subsequently saw the light. <laughs> um, and I have to say that, you know, most people do want to make an exception. It's certainly true today in surveys that are shown over and over again that uh, people want to censor what they consider to be racist speech and misogynistic speech. Uh, but the Supreme Court has said that the bedrock principle of free speech is viewpoint neutrality. Government may not pick and choose uh, ideas or messages that it favors or disfavors. And I just want to make one other point to be fairly brief here on a very complex question, Kat. And that is that even if we have very strongly protected free speech as a matter of law, which we by and large do, the U.S. Supreme Court has been very speech protective overall, but we are not going to enjoy meaningful free speech in reality unless we also have a culture of free speech. Now we have too much of a cancel culture and not enough of a culture of free speech. And I want to commend Cato for a disturbing but important survey that it did with YouGov and published at the end of July that showed that a full 62% of Americans fear expressing and therefore do not express their views on important public policy issues. And 32% fear that if they do so, they're going to be subject to some kind of tangible economic reprisal. And this was completely across all demographic, political, partisan, ideological categories. That said, the groups that were especially fearful of expressing their views were number one, young people, and number two, the most highly educated people. So when we're talking about the campus context, this underscores that people who are spending time on our campuses are coming out with less ability to confidently express their viewpoint, more self-censorship, less free speech. Very, very disturbing. 
That is isn't disturbing indeed, Nadine. Thank you. Uh, Jason, I would love to hear your perspective on free speech as well. Yes, uh, free speech is an idea and ideas have histories. And uh, my own academic background in, in the career that I had before Cato was uh, as a historian of ideas. So uh, when you look at the ancient world, there's very little in the way of what we would call free speech. Uh, the Roman senators enjoyed an absolute right to free speech, but there were few of them. Uh, the uh, idea of free speech began with lots of little special privileges, kind of like that one, where a few people because of their status or because of some special job that they have, get a right to free speech. Uh, one of them, that arises in medieval times is the idea of academic freedom, which is one of the ideas that actually predates the US right to freedom of speech, but uh, is neither identical with it uh, nor simply a subset of it. Uh, but uh, throughout history, we've been able to look at instances where people are capable of uh, speaking or expressing themselves without fear of, of reprisal. And we've recognized that when people can do that, there are definite advantages both for them and for those around them. And gradually over the course of time, uh, we have discovered what we uh, now know as, as the, uh, the right of free speech or free expression. Uh, this means several things for where we are today. First, uh, we haven't talked about academic freedom in particular as, as a strain within free speech or as a, a particular thing that you can do with your free speech. We, we absolutely should do that. And second, uh, we have an obligation to look a bit at how free speech arose out of particular privileges and then the conceptual generalization of them to the whole society. Uh, why do we need free speech? Well, we need it for lots of different reasons. It's not just because someone is an academic doing scientific research or doing uh, economic research, say. It's not just because someone has a special job as part of the government and they get to do it. It's useful in a wide variety of different areas. And that's something that we've slowly, gradually discovered throughout history. And it would be uh, a terrible shame if owing to certain technological changes, for example, we came to think that this right was not worth the cost or was too uh, uh, risky to allow to people. Thanks, Jason. Uh, and I'm glad you started talking about technology. You set up the historical example for us. Well, Katie, you you work at Facebook, and that's sort of been at the forefront of the free, free speech debate, um, or at least the conversation about free speech, I think, uh, in the past few years. Um, what What is your perspective on free speech, uh, both what it is and what its importance is? <clears throat> Well, as a student of Professor Downs, I just have to take his definition because he's the one that taught it to me. So um, I'll have to defer personally to Professor Downs on that. But um, in all seriousness, I think, you know, what we've really been seeing um, in the online space is at Facebook, we want to give people the right and the ability to express what they believe. And there's a lot of questions now around though, what speech should be allowed to stay up versus be taken down? What is the difference between freedom of speech versus freedom of reach? And the amount and how many people might see content that somebody puts up um, on the platform? How do you think about countering mis and disinformation? Um, we've been experimenting a lot with labels to give people right now accurate information around the elections. When people say things, if something is uh, marked as false by a fact checker, we don't take it down, but we do provide alternative information for people to see, not alternative, but additional information to see the fact check and to know that something has been fact checked false and we reduce the distribution, but we don't fully take it off the platform. And so I think an important discussion in all of this is not only the question of 
the people's right to, to say something and have freedom of speech or freedom of expression. But then what are the rights after that and what are the penalties based upon what somebody is saying online and what are the roles of online platforms that are doing that? And I think we're just at the very beginning of having that discussion of what those right levers are and what those right, um, uh, whether penalties or promotions of that speech might be in an online world that I think are gonna still take us quite a while to figure out. Thanks, Katie. Uh, that's that's certainly something for us all to ponder, and it gives us a real world application of some of the stuff we're talking about. And um, when we're thinking of, about the real world applications, Robbie, you uh, for your book Panic Attack, you spoke to uh, activists, um, young activists uh, on campuses, and I think you had some really disturbing, but also some interesting revelations about how young people are thinking about speech nowadays, particularly how um, that discourse is happening on college campuses. Can you, well, with that perspective, can you talk a little bit about both their view and your view on free speech? Absolutely. Uh, I spoke uh, with a lot of activists for my book um, who saw um, uh, safe, th their redefinition of safety and how that impacts free speech was what I found most interesting and indeed troubling because I would talk to people who would say that their right to safety includes uh, not just safety from like being physically assaulted or something, but it also includes their emotional well-being or indeed one person said my right to feel affirmed whenever I leave my home. So if you have, if you believe that you have a right to be not just, not just, not punched, but also affirmed wherever you go, then that right would obviously be in conflict with a general with someone else's right to practice free speech. So it, and 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 physical safety being a kind of a kind of trump card or exception. Uh, if you're if you're broadening that to include someone's emotional well-being, then you're very much putting the general right to free speech. Uh, in trouble or you're putting it back on a historical foundation where because historically we didn't uh, we didn't separate words from actions it was the same thing to you know to attack the to, to plot against the king to plot a, a physical act of violence against the king was the same thing as to publicly denounce the king or speak out against the king these would both be handled as as uh, these would both be punishable uh, only since the Enlightenment did we recognize some difference between you can you can say something and that's not the same as physical actions. And to some degree, I, I the the activists I, I talk about in my book are I think trying to erase that distinction or or, or go back to the earlier understanding of it in a way that very much uh, threatens the the new the very new conception of words and actions being different and thus free speech being possible. Thank you, Robbie. Um, your point about free speech under being under threat um, kind of brings us back to a, a recent Cato poll by Emily Eakins um, that a few of you have alluded to already. And this this poll came out in late July, and she, Emily found uh, that 62% of Americans say that they have political views that they're afraid to share. What's interesting here is um, that these are people ranging from 50% of, um, no, I'm sorry, these are people ranging from the left to the right, um, which I found very interesting here. That includes majorities of Democrats, 52%, 59% of independents, and 77% of Republicans, who all say that they're afraid to share their political opinions. Um, so with that in mind, what really are the biggest threats to free speech nowadays? Is it is it the self censorship or is it something else? Uh, both in general and specifically on college campuses, um, Robbie. Since we were just talking about um, college campuses, maybe we can start with you. Sure. Well, generally speaking, um, I, I think for people who are not on college campuses, the government is always the major threat to free speech. Is always the one that must be. Uh, uh, fought against by or excellent advocacy organizations like uh, like Cato um, and others. Uh, it, so it, it's and it's always you have to be careful not to you know we're very focused on what's going on campus 
uh, often because uh, it's it's kind of ridiculous or it's funny. Um, it, it, it sometimes it, you can be overly focused on the college campuses to the detriment of, of uh, you know free speech being threatened everywhere else. But as long as we are talking about uh, college campuses, I think a small number of very militantly anti speech students have found a way to weaponize campus policies uh, such that it's very difficult, especially at elite colleges, elite institutions, to have um, conversations that are uncomfortable for them. And they weaponize this not, not just against other students and visiting speakers, but their own professors. I have spoken with so many uh, very, very left-leaning professors who are more in the kind of ACLU mode who say that they are terrified of their own students and they think their students are going to start investigations against them if they say or do they say the wrong thing in class or someone is bothered in class, even if it's a perfectly reasonable discussion. So that so the students themselves, not all students, not most students, but a small number of them are, I, I think, a serious threat uh, at, at many, uh, many elite institutions on college campuses. And their view is is starting to become very, very uh, influential uh, on social media and in uh, elite media spaces like, the again, this thing with the New York Times earlier this summer where they essentially apologized and fired the opinion editor for publishing uh, uh, an op-ed by Senator Tom Cotton, an op-ed that I thought was very much wrong, but certainly an opinion worth expressing or worth hearing and then worth challenging and rebutting. But they had to apologize for it because the staff, the, uh, the some staff members said it was a matter of their own safety. It was creating an unsafe workplace environment, which is exactly the language that comes from the campus uh, activists who say it's a matter of ed safety in the educational environment, safety in the classroom to have speech that makes us uncomfortable. Thanks, Robbie. Don, this is this is what Robbie's talking about is exactly what motivated you to write your book. It was it was this feeling, I believe, <clears throat> that um, that these that the rise of these views on campuses would be moving out so uh, moving out to the wider world so uh, what do you see as the greatest threats to free speech well they're building on would what it robbie be had that to say. i'm sorry they're building on what robbie had to say uh you have a conjunction of long-standing sort of universal grounds for censorship and uh, fear of expressing your ideas in in certain cultural situations uh, censorship is based on fear. People are afraid to go against the grain, you know, the silence, the spiral of science, silence kind of idea. So that's there too, as well as sort of moral, the difference between moral conviction, I talk about this in the book, and what I would call moralism. Uh, we all need to have moral convictions. Morality is what makes a good life. But when morality moves into moralism, it starts driving or driving its force, you know, psychodynamic sense from more aggressive instincts and it could become repressive. It can lead to what uh, Justice Holmes in a famous free speech dissent says, uh, believing that ideas with which you disagree are fraught with evil. And so those are kind of universal tendencies. And then when you combine that now with a culture that is growing, you know, becoming more intolerant of certain kinds of viewpoints, you get a really combustible uh, kind of mix and uh, now, as we mentioned, you have all these new bureaucratic policies, especially your bias reporting policies. I know when one of the universities in Portland encouraged uh, students to report to the police when they encountered uncomfortable ideas. And this sort of speaks to the thing that Robbie was talking about, uh, the conflation, and I have a whole chapter on this, uh, the conflation of speech and action. Uh, so that suddenly words become fraught not only with evil, but with danger to the self, a kind of fragility uh, position. And uh, we see a lot more of that, uh, both in the vernacular on campus, but also now it has spread to the, the wider society. And uh, that's a real problem. I trace in the book how this really began uh, coming, the Skokie case was really a turning point in terms of this where the Nazi speech was seen as an assault, not just speech in the public forum. In that case, for understandable reasons, but if you expand beyond the Skokie case to, uh, I don't want this op-ed by Tom Cotton in my paper because it endangers me. And that was 
kind of existential language used by those who didn't want that op-ed in that paper. So the conflation of speech and action, which is similar to the conflation of uh, ob the rise of subjectivity as the main defense for a claim of harm. This is harmful speech because I feel this way and that should be sufficient rather than having to appeal to some common standard of reason uh, as, and to persuade someone that this is definitely something harmful that a reasonable person would feel. We have a movement away from the reasonable person standard to a more subjective uh, kind of standard. So that's certainly you know, a, a definite problem here. Uh, and uh, on campus, it's the bureaucratic side that really has to be examined carefully. Uh, disruptions are an important thing. You can move away. We went away from dis a lot of disruptions that occurred in the 2016, 2017 period. Uh, last year, I think there were only nine or so reported. But the real harm is taking place more in the culture. And the problem of culture is exacerbated by the fact that not enough voices are speaking up. Uh, both Robbie and Nadine have pointed out how on campus, uh, it's really a minority of students that are pushing this. Uh, uh, students of various races, it's not just a minority race issue. A lot of white students are doing it. And uh, uh, they're not being countered. They're getting some support from the campus bureaucracy and social media. Social media bullying problem is very real. And uh, uh, it's making people afraid to fill the public space with counter views in favor of free speech. So the minority viewpoint uh, is prevailing in those situations. So it's really incumbent upon people that want to support free speech principles uh, to speak up and to organize and to mobilize, uh, which is something we'll be talking about later, I hope. Definitely, I think that that's very important. Jason, did you have uh, some thoughts that you wanted to share as well on this? Uh, yes, I, I want to add one thing, uh, which is that there's a, a, I think, real but modest analogy to be made with the issue uh, criminal justice and policing reform. Uh, in both of these issues, in campus free speech and in, uh, in, in policing reform, uh, we have seen a transformation in recent years that has been social media driven. Uh, people hear about these incidents through Facebook or Twitter before they hear about them in the national media. They hear about them in ways that are a lot more immediate with, uh, with video taken on the scene when speakers are shouted down uh, or when police behave in ways that are, are uh, difficult or impossible to justify to the public. And uh, being able to, to have that video evidence is very, very powerful. Uh, we can discuss the difficult problems of quantifying the crisis, and we might find that there is or there isn't a crisis in terms of raw numbers. Uh, but what we have is, is, is at the very least, a, a crisis of salience. We are seeing it more. And, uh, we need to uh, answer it if, if only for that reason, and also think about the role that uh, social media has in, in uh, encouraging us to, to think in certain ways or not. Uh, that can be difficult to do while you're in the middle of sort of the rush of politics. Uh, but uh, best is that uh, the end product of political discussions is not going to be the kind of universal comforting agreement that some people on the left seem to, to uh, believe it should be. Uh, the end product of discussions about politics is voting. And in voting, we almost by definition are not going to come to uh, a universal consensus. We're going to disagree and those disagreements are just going to stand. Uh, that's uh, sometimes how it is in a democracy. And the idea that uh, we have to come to some kind of a consensus on, on everything, I think, may be a part of the problem. And I do believe that that idea or that, that uh, supposition is, uh, is fostered by social media. Whether, whether, I mean, I'm not saying it's intentional, but I think that uh, I think that the idea that here you are with all your friends and don't we all agree uh, can 
uh, translate into politics and into discussions of current events in in some uh, not necessarily helpful ways. Well, uh, since since you brought up the topic of social media, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let Katie respond to that if she would like to. Yeah, I think you know overall it's it sort of goes back to sort of that overall discussion that I think we're having. I think social media we have seen has done a lot to help people who normally wouldn't have a platform or a megaphone or an ability to um, get their viewpoints out there or organize um, to be able to do so in a way that has had very positive um, uh, consequences on our society and has allowed more people to be a part of the, the civic debate. Um, but there's also parts of it that um, in many different facets um, that maybe are not as as great um, when thinking about uh, again the 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 comment sections that you may have the discussions that you may have um, the the larger groups of people that can that can be commenting on your stuff I've had experience that myself personally um, that can be difficult to know how to how to manage and so. I think we're we're very much in that beginning of stages of of trying to figure out that that right balance of of right what's what's right there. But I do continue to hold out optimistic hope that I think social media has actually allowed uh, people to better organize and and to maybe um, get different viewpoints out there that they normally wouldn't be able to do so given the high cost of you know advertising on television or just not naturally having um that platform to get um viewpoints out to um large numbers of people yeah i i think that that's a really positive point and you know on that you know obviously we are broadcasting this on social media and um where I'm I'm looking right here on Twitter and I can see all of these people weighing in as you're talking. And so I do want to take a moment to remind folks, uh, if you are watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or um, some of the social media channels that we're currently using our free speech on, um, you can post questions in the comments um, on the video or if you're on Twitter, use hashtag Cato Books. Uh, I'm seeing some great ones in here that I'm looking forward to asking you all uh, in a little bit. Um, but on that note, is is free speech still alive on the American College campus? Uh, what, what makes campuses unique or worth drawing special attention to when it comes to this issue in particular? Is there something different about campus free speech compared to speech in other venues? Um, Nadine, I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, uh, a very good place to start, Kat, would be the United States Supreme Court, which has consistently recognized that freedom of speech, important as it is overall, is especially important in the academic context. The court started saying that in cases back more than a century ago, uh, and saying so not only for the benefit of those of us who are members of academic communities, I say that as a professor myself, but also because of the special role that universities aspire to play and that we all hope they play in our society as special enclaves for the pursuit of truth and the dissemination of truth and information for the honing of citizenry. I mean, not only the people uh, who are enrolled as students or faculty members, but campuses um, consistently open up their facilities to speakers from outside and to community members uh, to serve as a forum for presenting and discussing and debating, even ferociously debating, even the most controversial ideas. Uh, and that recognizes the really essential role that campuses play in our democratic republic to help hone people who are going to be responsible citizens who exercise that great power of sovereignty that's recognized in the opening words of the Constitution, we the people. But how can we do that effectively unless we engage in 
fearless and free and vigorous and robust debate, especially debate that is willing to question and criticize even harshly, even especially the most widely accepted uh, ideas and orthodoxies of the day. Katie, you found yourself at the center of one of those uh, debates on campus when you were a student, a student of Dawn's at the University of Wisconsin. Um, tell us a little bit more about your experiences there or um, and how they've helped you uh, think about campus free speech. Yeah, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot. And one of my favorite things about Madison and particularly even going back to the student newspaper, we had the Badger Herald, but there was also the Daily Carnal. One of the few, it continues to be one of the few universities that has two student newspapers. And there were numerous, I mean, I mentioned one of the ones that got one of the most press coverage, but I one of the, my favorite things about my university, my time at the University of Madison was the fact that we could have these robust debates between those of us who are on the paper and the editorial board, those that were in student government. I mean, Don's classes alone, he had to make us hold up signs when we wanted to speak because we were all trying to debate one another. Um, and it was a true culture of, of allowing that, that robust debate that, and really like understanding how to listen and be able to listen and absorb and discuss these issues with people who may disagree with you in a way that just really made everyone's arguments stronger and allowed you to think about the best ways to move to move forward. And what I see today and what concerns me today is that I feel like that same culture is not being instilled in people. And instead, it's more about um, trying to shut it down or just trying not to listen at all or like I, I continue to think a lot more about the penalties that come with with speech that people are trying to put on folks that are beyond just i don't want to listen to you but i want to prevent anybody else from hearing what you have to say that particularly concerns me and has been a big shift in the 20 years since i've been on campus Wonderful. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Don, I would love to hear your perspective on this as well. Yeah, well, I certainly agree with everything that's been said. Uh, as I portray in the book, you know, we are a distinctive kind of institution that courts and other people, you know, in terms of our social contract with society, that we are a place where the pursuit of truth is supposed to be primary. One big theme I have in the book is the right prioritization of values, that that has to be the primary thing. Uh, universities do a lot of other stuff. We have sports, you know, we have concerns about diversity, et cetera, but we will not be true to ourselves and to our commitment to society unless we make the pursuit of truth uh, the primary goal that we have, a primary mission. And uh, uh, within an academic setting though, that's a special kind of pursuit because I have a whole chapter in the book uh, distinguishing and, and comparing in a favorable way, academic freedom and free speech more generally. Uh, under free speech, you have a right to uh, say pretty much anything you want unless it meets one of the limited Supreme Court exceptions, which means that it's more or less directly related to some sort of uh, concrete harm. And uh, you have a right to even lie unless you're libeling somebody or you're using it for some sort of purpose to achieve uh, a gain through fraud or something. You have a right to go out there. You have a right even to claim you have a military background uh, when you don't. There's a famous Supreme Court case on that. But when it comes to certain academic uh, situations in a university, professional situations like the classroom, uh, research, and uh, hiring people, more or less, you know, the academic professional context, uh, speech is more constrained. Uh, a, it has to be based on intellectual standards of inquiry, uh, can't be based on fraud, it has to seek excellence. Uh, and uh, we, we don't allow quacks in the classroom. Uh, we don't allow uh, people to teach astrology in the astronomy department, for example. Uh, there was a case at the University of Ottawa where a physics professor or lecturer wanted to spend a lot of time teaching his students how to politically organize. And he was called it his academic freedom and he was fired. 
So there is a professional realm where the speech is bounded more by standards of excellence and judgment based on that. And then you have the other realms of campus, public forum, student organizations, uh, everyday encounters where more generous, uh, less rigorous free speech standards apply. And you're allowed to really sort of let it all out. And in my book, I portray the two, realm, the two realms as sort of related, distinct, yet nourishing each other. And uh, so that makes the university a very distinctive kind of place where there's a, I portray it as a propitious balance between free speech more generally and academic speech, which is more rigorous and more technical. And the, the two should go together. If we do not live up to that as our primary mission, we have let down not only our students, not only our institution, but our society, as many of us on, on this panel have mentioned. Um, and I think, you know, obviously we're doing this event virtually as um, many people around the world are right now uh, because of the elephant in the room, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And because of the pandemic, many college campuses are doing mainly or only virtual learning this year. How has that impacted the situation with free speech? And um, how might future uh, shifts to a more virtual or non-traditional campus option um, affect people's ability to freely engage with ideas? Nadine, I'd love to hear from you as a college professor. It's too soon to know what is actually happening, Kat, but I will tell you an immediate reasonable fear uh, when it was announced that last spring that campuses were going online. Turning Point USA issued a, uh, which is a conservative organization on campus, uh, issued through Charlie Kirk, its head, uh, a, a, a joyous declaration to its supporters saying, oh, now we can more easily document professors who are indoctrinating their students in radical ideas. Well, first of all, let me say I really oppose indoctrinating. That is inconsistent with educating. However, I thought it was very heartening that immediately there was strong protest against that communication uh, from organizations and individuals all across the ideological spectrum, uh, including the Koch organizations that are certainly conservative, uh, but recognized that this was a deep threat to academic freedom and free speech, to take a climate that is already saturated with self-censorship because people are afraid that they will say something that will be taken as offensive uh, in some way, and then to magnify and amplify that fear by knowing that everything is going to be recorded and potentially available for the whole world in perpetuity, including to be taken out of context, this is could really have a deep freeze impact. Now, I don't want, you know, I'm making an ideological New, ideologically neutral point. I want to point out that more recently in the wake of the George Floyd murder, uh, there have been calls by a couple of Black Lives Matter activist groups on campus, including Princeton, and more recently I heard at the University of San Diego Law School, uh, calling for monitors to be monitoring class discussions uh, to make sure that people aren't saying something that they view as racist. So whether this threat of su surveillance and recording and calling out and punishing is coming from the left or the right, it is equally threatening to the kind of robust and uninhibited discourse that is so essential, especially in our classroom discussions, e even if they are online. point. Um, a lot of people do say, a lot of people critique um, the discussion about uh, free speech, particularly on campus, saying that what's actually happening isn't free speech suppression, it's rather the re natural result of a free market and ideas, and that people are simply choosing not to engage with or support 
uh, those expressing ideas that they find to be hateful or damaging. Uh, Robbie, how would you respond to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I find that argument pretty baffling because if it was just people saying, well, I disagree with this and here's why, I think everyone would have, uh, all of us would have no problem with that. In fact, we would applaud it. Um, that's clearly not what the, the critics are doing. They're saying, um, I disagree with you and you should not be able to say that. I should prevent you. I should prevent anyone else on this campus from hearing you. Um, I also think that, you know, this matters. Obviously, we're, you, you have the right to advocate, <laughs> to use your speech to advocate against free speech in general. Um, but I think it's bad for you to do that. So I'm going to criticize you for doing that. I also think the language of cancel culture is important here. I define canceling as when you're criticizing not someone's views or their speech, but when you're when you're um, holding their, the bad thing they've said or done as wholly representative of the person. This happens often in, in, mom in canceling, where someone did or said something a long time ago, and instead of the critic saying, I disagree with this person, or that idea was wrong for this reason, they say, or they, they don't say that was a bad idea or a bad expression. They say that is a bad person. Like you are supposed to be defined perpetually and forever by the very worst you know, mistake you've made or thing you've said carelessly or thoughtlessly. That's a very punishing and unforgiving. It's particularly hard on young people. I feel so bad for teenagers, uh, people who are coming of age in a time where we are recording and remembering everything everyone's ever said, giving very little room so socially, culturally, not from a legal formal punishment standpoint, but from the standpoint of, of imposing um, informal cultural sanctions or job prospect sanctions uh, on people who e even are very young say or do something wrong and we're not allowing for any uh, personal growth. I think that's bad. Obviously, that doesn't have to do with the, the, the First Amendment uh, kind of uh, for free speech protections, but I think we're becoming a very um, intolerant uh, and, and unhealthy uh, place where we will, where we we will never forgive people, and we will define you solely as as the as the most problematic thing you've ever said. That's uh, a really key point here. We want to have room for growth, where uh, free speech allows people to discuss these ideas, and you know maybe someone does have some bad ideas, um, but because of the discussion, they're able to move forward or change positions or things like that, rather than the one thing you say once haunts you for the rest of your life, right? Um, Jason, what are your thoughts on cancel culture and free speech? Yeah, yeah we are uh, talking about this in a very abstract way, and we are uh, lumping together a lot of different things, I think, in that in that term, and I think it's best to unpack it. Uh, I do not think that shouting down speakers who've been invited to speak on campus by student groups is uh, a good uh, expression of academic freedom. I think it's something that, in fact, is is very inimical to academic freedom, and I do not support. But if someone uh, whom you don't know on Facebook shows up on your wall and says a bunch of uh, really odious racist things, well, uh, the normal reaction to that is uh, to block them. And uh, I don't think those two things belong in the same category. Uh, I think that uh, the second has very little to do with the first. And I think that uh, if uh, if that's going to be a part of cancel culture as as uh, we are defining it, then it's not a very useful term. Uh, we have different roles that we play in our personal lives and in the pursuit of learning in the academy. Uh, the pursuit of learning in the academy demands that we uh, play a bit of a role, and the role is one where we agree to take ideas seriously, even if in our heart of hearts we believe them to be wrong. Uh, we take them seriously, we listen to them. Uh, is it likely that the typical blatant racist Facebook troll is going to show up on campus? It's not likely, but it has happened. Uh, do they deserve to be shouted down? No, they don't. They deserve to be ignored if you believe you have nothing to learn from them. Uh, they deserve to be 
answered in a thoughtful and critical way, which is absolutely a part of, of uh, what goes on in the academy. And when you are not a part of the academy, when you are not acting in a, a capacity as a researcher or a student, uh, you are welcome and encouraged to unfriend or block or refuse to associate with in, in regular life uh, people who uh, have views that you find odious. That's, that's not a part of academic freedom. That's not uh, something that uh, affects or touches on or, or uh, uh, destroys academic freedom in any significant way at all. Uh, you have the right to choose your friends. You have the right to choose the people you associate with. And uh, this might sound like it's all a bunch of, uh, of complicated, conflicting directives, but uh, fortunately, libertarians have an answer for that. Uh, we believe that the best rule is the one in which the uh, individual has a right to speak, but property owners have the right to say, well, you're not allowed to speak on my property. My property is uh, that which I dispose of, and I, I choose the uh, the individuals who do and don't speak on it. Uh, Facebook allows us to associate or not with people uh, on exactly that basis. The academy has to work on a somewhat different basis because it has to be somewhat, at least somewhat more open to a wide range of views. Uh, it is troubling when a speaker is shouted down on campus. It is not so troubling when uh, you have uh, blocked someone on uh, on social media. That is something that I, I don't find necessarily the same thing. Thank you, Jason. Uh, I'm going to take this uh, opportunity to start asking uh, some of the plethora of questions we've got coming in from our online audience. Um, again, if you are watching online, you can post... Oh, everyone's watching online, please post your questions either on the Cato website, on our Facebook or YouTube comments, or on Twitter using hashtag Cato books. Um, the first question that I would like to ask feeds really well into what we've all been talking about. Anonymous asks via the Cato website, panelists are suspicious of voiced harm is real and more a foil to squelch unfavorable views. And yet, White supremacists who Trump embraced hold views that the very existence of another person or citizen is undesirable, not unlike the Nazis aim to eradicate the Jews. How does a free speech, oh, oh sorry, how does a free society allow this? Um, Nadine, um, you've obviously dealt with exactly this issue while you were at the ACLU. I would love to hear your thoughts on it. Absolutely, Kat. And if I can inject a personal note, I am the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Uh, and I lost many relatives who were murdered in Hitler's uh, genocidal attack on Jews and other minority groups. So I actually base my opposition to censoring, even Nazi, even other types of hate speech, on the belief that censorship does more harm than good. And belief is too weak a word. Evidence shows that censorship of hate speech does more harm than good. After all, in the Weimar Republic, during which Hitler rose to power, there were very strong anti-hate speech laws, which were very strictly enforced. There were a lot of prosecutions, including against Nazis. And obviously, it did not stop their rise to power. In fact, many people believe it actually helped them because the trials became big propaganda platforms for them, during which they got attention and sympathy that they otherwise never would have. Uh, the problem there was failure to punish the Nazis from engaging in actual violence. So we again get back to that speech conduct distinction. If we have people in our society who have those racist, anti-Semitic, hateful views, we need to know 
who they are. We need to be able to respond to them. We need to be able to um, persuade other people not to be attracted to their fold. Law enforcement needs to know who they are so that it can monitor to make sure that they're not engaging in any conspiracies or actual acts of violence. So, uh, and I actually, there are cases, including cases of former leaders of white supremacist organizations who actually have been weaned away from their views. And it hasn't happened as a result of criminalizing them or censoring them. It has happened as a result of engagement with them. Uh, so if we really want to counter the underlying problem of hateful attitudes, and we really want to counter the problem of actual discriminatory violence and other discriminatory conduct, then let's use education and other forms of speech to go after the ideas and attitudes, and let's use law enforcement to go and, and civil laws, anti-discrimination laws, to go after the hateful discriminatory conduct. Um, Don, you you actually changed your mind on this specific issue, uh, as Nadine alluded to early in this event. Um, can you can you tell us a little bit about how your views changed over time and why? Well, part of it was based on my experience at the university when I saw how the speech codes were being applied. Uh, <clears throat> they were pretty broad. They were similar to the the uh, ordinances that were passed in Skokie at the time uh, when Skokie took place. And um, I saw the harms. I and mean, Nadine was referring or uh, just referred to the harms that are associated with censorship and the unintended consequences. I saw that on campus, certainly. And it made me think about that kind of right of free speech more generally. But I should say that uh, Nadine is right. We need to distinguish specific acts of speech that are connected to criminal behavior or to threatening behavior, you know, a real threat. It's not protected by the First Amendment. Uh, the uh, Virginia case in 2003, where the Supreme Court ruled that putting a burning cross on a highway for people to see when they pass by could be construed as a, tr a true threat, in which case it would not be protected by the First Amendment. Uh, those laws need to be enforced. And uh, similarly, it's appropriate for uh, the government to keep a really close eye on dangerous groups. And, and sometimes it's even appropriate to uh, infiltrate them if necessary. So you have a sense of what's going on with them. The Fourth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment can allow that. So uh, we do allow those kinds of groups to speak because of our concerns about unintended consequences if we shut them up. Uh, spillover effect on other kinds of speech, et cetera. But we must, A, respond to them with vigilance. Uh, when I wrote the Skokie book, I interviewed uh, a leading survivor in Skokie. Uh, and she told me that the lesson she learned from the Holocaust was to be your brother's keeper. And that is, you know, look out for people that are in danger, protect them. And, uh, and in a similar way, we need to do that when someone makes a, a racist comment or a comment that is threatening someone, we need to speak up, all right? As Jason pointed out, that's not necessarily canceling, or maybe if it's canceling, it's a justifiable kind of canceling. But we don't wanna suppress that speech in general uh, because of the implications uh, of doing so. But we also need to be vigilant in terms of upholding the criminal laws. Uh, some states in Europe, for example, uh, do not allow racist rhetoric, which the United States does allow, but then when crimes are committed in the name of that rhetoric, uh, there's less punishment than there is in the United States. So we have a lot of tools available to deal with this that don't involve uh, speech suppression. So we can protect our First Amendment rights at the same time that we protect our safety. And we've got to find the right way to do that balance. Thanks, Don. Um, I'd like to go next to a question um, I saw on YouTube. Uh, D Nats asks, um, is there a cancel culture amongst libertarians? Robbie, you are a libertarian journalist. What do you think? Um, 
invariably, whenever you have libertarians together, you'll have uh, one or more of them arguing that someone else isn't a true libertarian and they <laughs> do, not, uh, do not have the right to bear the label. Um, I actually think it's because we are, it's sort of, um, it has to do with our philosophy. We're a libertarian, uh, libertarians are an individualist philosophy. So I think we, we end up being uh, suspicious of actually just forming groups in general. And, and you want to you wanna say, well, where are our differences? I really, I'm the libertarian, you're something else. Sometimes I call it labeltarianism, the, the, uh, the need among libertarians to find like a unique word that describes just me. So that we, that we, that we won't ever form a group and we won't ever form a, a cohesive political group if you do this. I, I do think... You know, and this is why I'm careful when I, I describe cancel culture. I don't think that means there should be absolutely zero gatekeeping or you can never call out bad behavior or something like that. You should call it out. You just shouldn't go so overbroad that if someone did or said something, you know, that was bad like 20 years ago, they can never be forgiven for it. People now who persist, I, I recently said, uh, Republicans should disassociate themselves from Laura Loomer, who is running for Congress, uh, who is a conspiracy theorist, and uh, she unfortunately is endorsed by Donald Trump and uh, and and Matt Gates, uh, who's a Florida Congress uh, congressman. Uh, she is someone you like. She should be canceled if that's the right way to describe it. Not that she shouldn't be able to speak in a public forum. Certainly, she should. If you want to invite her and debate her, you can. Uh, she should have the same legal protections for speech, uh, but but you can you can you should be able to practice dissociation. But that's because of views that she holds now and expressed today. I would not hold against her something that was maybe unwise that she said uh, years and years ago. I think that's that's the difference I, I'm aiming for in kind of the cultural discussion of what is canceling and what is gatekeeping. Um, Katie, did you have some more thoughts about cancel culture? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of build on some of the stuff Jason had been saying earlier about um, the differences about where you can, um, um, where people can say things. Because I do think there's a difference between um, a public square versus, for instance, your own home or like a post that you put on Facebook where somebody can, can comment that, you know, I post a lot of my stuff publicly and anybody can come and comment on that. And I think one of the interesting things too in debates that I think is worth having and as we think about this um, is where does that come in for um, public figures on their own social media accounts and thinking about what comments they can allow or not allow. There's been a lot of court cases already around public figures and politicians who are being told that they cannot remove comments from their own social media posts, um, that people are going there and, and saying them um, what those types of moderation tools are. And so while I think it's more clear cut when it comes to individuals and what you can allow is to using Jason's words, your property or not, I do think that there's still also a very open question in terms of what we should allow and what public figures are allowed to have in terms of people being able to respond back to them and the forums and where they can where they can do that, you know, in the offline world, you have to have permits for protests and you can't necessarily go lock yourself necessarily in somebody's office and force a senator or an elected official to listen to you. What does that look like in the in the online world um, is something that um, I've been thinking about quite a bit. Thanks, Katie. Um, I would like to ask an interesting question um, from Twitter. Don Anderson asks, um, what are the origins of free speech uh, that are rooted in slavery and laws? For example, um, she mentions uh, enslaved uh, people not being allowed to give a testimony in court against white slave owners um, or similar situations. Uh, Nadine, do you have some thoughts you want to share on this? I do. This um, really perceptive question really shines a spotlight on a point that Don and I were making, which is that uh, no matter how well intended, any censorial laws are always predictably disproportionately used to silence those who are advocating 
for justice. Those who are members of minority groups, whether racial minority groups or po dissident political groups, uh, the censorship law is used to silence their speech. So not only were uh, those who were enslaved in this country completely denied all free speech. Uh, they weren't even allowed to learn to read, but it was a crime to uh, teach an enslaved person to read. Abolitionist expression was uh, censored all over uh, the Southern, uh, the slaveholding states. The civil rights activists in the 20th century were consistently punished for their speech. And, you know, why did Martin Luther King write his historic letter from the Birmingham jail? That is why. King and John Lewis and other civil rights leaders all opposed censorship, even under so-called hate speech laws, because they knew that their speech and their ideas were the ones that were seen as hateful and dangerous and subversive and, and more likely to be suppressed. John, you, ha you also had uh, some thoughts on this issue, I believe. Would you like to weigh in? Right, okay, and, you know, Jonathan Rausch has argued uh, and written about how the gay rights movement rode the back of free speech to make its claims, and it's been very successful. So, you know, uh, Dean is exactly right. Throughout history, it's always the uh, minority or oppressed viewpoint that if it's allowed to speak out and mobilize, and granted, it's a burden that's put on your shoulders to do that, but that's how we've engaged in constructive social change. And my book gives a lot of examples of that. Uh, you know, the tension between repression and freedom and the need to push the envelope through speech is, is quite clear. And uh, that means then that it's up to uh, those of us who believe in constructive social change to protect the right of free speech and provide the opportunity for people to mobilize and get their word out. They may not be successful right away, but uh, if they persist and their claim is just and we have a reasonable society, uh, they will prevail in the end. And once you engage in censorship, then you don't, you can't guarantee that down the line, your ox isn't going to be gored. I think too many people think that right now we have the stronger voice. So we're going to be able to suppress those who disagree with us, especially because we think that speech is itself a form of conduct to keep us down. But uh, once you open the door to censorship on grounds that you like, it can certainly come around and haunt you later. Uh, so we need to protect it in the name of protecting everyone's rights, but especially those uh, individuals who need to have their voices heard because they're in a disadvantaged situation in our society. Thanks. Thanks, Don. Uh, Jason, I know you've also thought about this issue uh, a little bit, how censorship laws uh, negatively or disproportionately impact um, those in a more marginalized position in society. Would you like to speak about that a little? Well, sure. Uh, in between the LGBT uh, rights struggle and the censorship that it encountered and the abolitionist struggle and the censorship that it encountered, there was a, a, a third struggle that was in between, which was the struggle for birth control. And during the early part of the 20th century, the Comstock laws uh, prohibited obscenity, uh, contraception, uh, abortion uh, paraphernalia or uh, abortifacients uh, from being sent through the mail. Uh, this was a direct affront to the individual free speech rights of everyone who wanted to use the US mail and also uh, uh, those who might have benefited from talking with people who had had uh, mm. received such things in the mail. Uh, even just very factual, medically-based uh, knowledge about the human body was sometimes implicated in, in uh, these types of, of prosecutions. Uh, so if you believe that it's only for uh, the groups that you might tick off as marginalized today, think again. If you use birth control, this is something that you should also hold dear as, as a right, because the uh, widespread use and acceptance of birth control only came about through a public education campaign. And that only came about because these laws were fought and challenged. <clears throat> Do 
to me. Um, oh, am I muted? I shouldn't be. Okay. Uh, hopefully you can all hear me. Sorry about that. I hear I went muted. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so I, we're running out of time, but we are a think tank. We do deal in policy and I would love to hear, um, some of the policy recommendations or policy changes that we can make to really protect free speech and uh, intellectual diversity in our society. Robbie, did you have some thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, much of the threat to free speech, um, I think, in the workplace, in on campuses as well, has been the weaponization of harassment law to chill speech. Uh, we certainly saw this on schools with Title IX, which is the law that uh, that prohibits uh, gender-based discrimination and harassment. But it, it was expanded uh, under the Obama education department to really uh, to really involve like all kinds of speech that would be perfectly appropriate for the classroom. But it would be if, if anyone was uncomfortable with anything, it would prompt an investigation under some very due process free procedures uh, that has thankfully uh, been changed uh, by the current uh, education department. I think more clarification, obviously, harassment law uh, has has legitimacy, uh, but more clarification from authorities that it that it does not that there does not automatically need to be an investigation every time someone's feelings are hurt. Um, that would that would keep uh, that would protect speech for professors uh, uh, in, in in a very important way. Robbie Nadine, I would love to hear your thoughts as well on uh, some of the policy that we can uh, we can use to protect uh, free speech. Proposal for oh, protecting Nadine. free speech. Oh, there we go. By, whoops, for protecting free speech by professors, but professors also have an obligation to protect free speech for ourselves, our colleagues, and our students. And here I'm just going to quote. Uh, from Don's book on page 129, he refers to the central, practical, and strategic point in this book. And notice he says the, not a. And it is as follows, the need for faculty members to act on the latent support for academic free speech that they apparently harbor in their breasts. So here we're talking about the silent majority that both Don's book and Robbie's book alludes to that are not taking advantage. It's especially shocking that tenured professors who have tenure for purpose for purposes of protecting, uh, giving them courage. It shouldn't take that much courage to speak out in defense of free speech. All of us have to do more of that. And for those who aren't professors, you have an obligation too. Speaking out in support of these principles and in support of people's rights, whether you agree or disagree with how they are exercising those rights, will really help to transform the cancel culture to a free speech culture. Um, I was going to ask uh, Don for your recommendation, since that is obviously a big part of this book, but uh, we are also almost out of time. So what I, what I would like to hear from each of our panelists today is uh, just one or two sentences. Uh, you know, we've had a great discussion. It's gone on for about an hour and a half. Uh, what would you like people to take out of this? And um, Don, as the author of this book and uh, the really the center of this discussion here today, um, what what would you like everyone's takeaway to be? Well, let me build on what Nadine just said. That's the importance of mobilizing that latent support that at least ostensibly exists on campus. And that involves enlisting faculty, sympathetic administrators, and students. At Madison, we had a great involvement by students uh, in our movement, and Katie was emblematic of that, uh, as well as some other people in the Badger Herald and elsewhere. elsewhere. So mobilization and making this an issue fill the public space with these concerns. Thanks, Don. Uh, Katie, since you just got name checked there by Don, um, what what one thing would you like people to take away from this discussion here tonight? I think just that we need to really be careful, <clears throat> excuse me, about 
what we are asking people to to do and and um, the potential implications of speech um, and the laws and things that we're we're asking of of folks uh, to do and to really be thinking about the long term consequences of potentially shutting down speech rather um, than trying to encourage rigorous debate. Thanks, Katie. Robbie, what are your thoughts? Um, one of the, I guess, uh, things we didn't get into as much, but will be an important discussion for, uh, for free speech uh, is going to be the domain of social media, which functions often like a public square, but are, but is owned and administered by private companies. So there, there is a tension now between some people want the government to force, um, uh, uh, you know, Facebook or Twitter or YouTube to have more free speech, more speech friendly policies. But is that itself a violation of free speech when it's the government telling a private organization what kind of speech they, they that they should allow more speech? Uh, it is an interesting um, uh, uh, dynamic that I think is increasingly going to be part of, uh, is going to occupy more and more space in the discussion about free speech landscape um, as we move forward. And my own kind of libertarian take is to, is to you know, use my free speech to advocate for platforms to, uh, to adopt rules that allow for more speech without, is better than bringing in the government, certainly to force them to do it, which does, uh, which does start to, uh, more, than, more than begins to, actually does uh, imperil speech in a different way. Thank you, Robbie. Uh, Jason, last thoughts? Uh, yes. Uh, when you are a citizen of a republic, you're playing a role. This is one of the things that Don's book taught me. You are playing a role. And that role involves a certain amount of stoicism. It involves uh, being willing to risk even up to personal insults. And uh, that isn't necessarily for everyone. Um, when you are uh, playing that role, you have an obligation to listen to opposite sides and to answer them and to uh, do so in a way that isn't necessarily always going to work out to you feeling happy and good and validated and affirmed at the end. Uh, there are going to be unsettled issues in politics. There are going to be things that don't go your way in politics. Uh, you're playing a role and your life is bigger than that. In your own personal life, which is not your political life, please do exercise discretion in choosing your friends. Please do uh, exercise judgment about the uh, kinds of company you will keep. When you are a citizen and you have your citizen hat on, though, uh, you need to engage with uh, even ideas that you find repulsive, even ideas that you find uh, unconscionable, and to say as clearly as you can why those ideas are unconscionable. Uh, we play different roles, and uh, that's well and good, and we should do things that way. Thanks, Jason. We're actually over time at this point. So I would like to thank all of today's panelists for taking part in an interesting and engaging discussion that uh, went by a lot faster than I was expecting it to. Um, and to all of you watching online, thank you so much um, for all of your questions. I apologize we weren't able to get to all of them. Um, there have been so many pouring in, but I hope that you will pick up your own copy of Free Speech and Liberal Education, A Plea for Intellectual Diversity and Tolerance. You can get that at cato.org slash books or wherever books are sold. And uh, continue the discussion, please, in the comments um, using the Cato Books hashtag. We always love to hear what you think. Um, and please do follow the Cato Books hashtag for more books from the Cato Institute. And at Cato events for more discussions like this. Uh, thank you and good night.